I guess I gotta get it going here. I'm Chris Brown. I'm a local writer. I'm really happy to see y'all come out on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Too nice to be indoors, but not too nice to hear these guys. Um, I don't work for Malvern Books. At least they don't pay me. Um, uh, uh, but I love the shop. It's uh, uh, in the absence of adventures in crime and space and other uh, 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 long gone but well remembered homes of the fantastic in Austin. It's uh, it's a place that's doing a lot both to um, uh, provide a market for a lot of different kinds of beautiful writing that doesn't otherwise really have a, a, a good home and also to try to create a lot of community uh, uh, here for writers and uh, uh, we're gonna try here this year to try to do a bi-monthly <coughs> series of uh, uh, readings and events uh, uh, devoted to the literature of the fantastic, sort of broadly defined, um, uh, featuring local writers and others, others uh, coming to town. And um, uh, uh, this is really kind of the, the, the one to launch it. We did have a reading a few weeks ago with Bruce Sterling and Yasmina Tasanovich. Uh, and the uh, next one will be on uh, January 6th. They'll be on uh, uh, Thursdays every month. Um, so tonight, or today, we're delighted to host uh, uh, two World Fantasy Award winners, uh, uh, both our reader and uh, our interviewer, uh, Howard Waldrop, uh, who's described in, in the uh, 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 materials for this event as a science fiction writer. I don't know that that term really adequately describes Howard's particular brand of fabulism. Uh, Howard, uh, as some of you may know, is one of the few writers to the left who is operating without access to the internet or to any kind of a word processing machine that requires the use of electricity. It's a quality we admire in him. Sometimes writes in actual hieroglyphics. Uh, and is uh, best known for his short fiction. Uh, he's also uh, uh, got a couple of longer works out there, including them bones. Uh, and widely collected. We have uh, uh, several of the collections here, I think, uh, uh, for you to check out. And he's going to be interviewed by um, uh, Bradley Denton, uh, who has traveled here uh, all the way from uh, Manchac to join us today. And uh, 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 Brad is also a World Fantasy Award winner and sort of best known for his uh, novels, uh, including uh, Blackburn, the, uh, the happiest serial killer novel you'll ever read. And uh, the government is alerting us to keep an eye out for a 1997 white Chevrolet Cavalier. Uh, just as I start talking about Brad's uh, serial killer novel, Pretty Creepy, thank you, uh, Ghost of Steve Jobs. And uh, uh, as well as Buddy Holly is alive and well on Ganymede, he's Virgin Chip, another great work. So uh, uh, the format is Howard is going to read for us from a brand new Howard Waldrop story, always an exciting event, notwithstanding the fact that uh, thanks to the uh, uh, underwater Austin airport, he had a rather jet-lagged trip to the World Fantasy Convention a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and then uh, Brad is going to uh, ask Howard uh, some questions designed to set the internet on fire once we post this video on YouTube. And then we have sort of open discussion and open mic if anybody has anything they want to briefly read uh, at the end of it uh, as well. So uh, with that, Howard, uh, would love to hear your piece. I'm moving like an old man because I'm an old man. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I read this at uh, World Fantasy Con a week and a half ago after a horrible trip there. Uh, and while I was reading it at World Fantasy Con, I realized I'd left parts of it out because I had three legal pads scattered around the hotel mm -hmm. room and sheets of paper and all this stuff, but I put them back together and reconform this story to be like I wanted it to be. So you are hearing a brand new story, even if you heard it at, at the <laughs> World Fantasy Con a week and a half ago. Anybody hear from there? Mm -hmm. Oh, you you went? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> the title right now of this story is uh, I could do some prefatory remarks, but the, we'll get right to it. The title of the story right now is Big Science at the Bijou. But after I read the story, if you come up with a better title <laughs> that 
that doesn't give away too much, isn't exactly about what the story is about, is ironic, and is intriguing at the same time, I will gladly take it, okay? Uh, you will see me read with primitive visual aids, okay? Uh, I used to give readings where I was all over the stage and there were multimedia, the, you know, there were, there were slides, there were, you know, the whole thing. But I've got some sense now and I can't see as well. So uh, I, don't, I won't move very much and stuff, but, uh, when, oh. Get that? Yeah, please. Break. I haven't had one of those before. It's aluminum coke, right? Yes. There you go. It's from the future. From the future. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> Just like the thing in uh, uh, we had a panel on, at ArmadilloCon this year on 2015, which of course was the year that Back to the Future 2 took place in. Uh, this is my space break indicator. When I drink from it, there's not a lot of space breaks in this story. It will indicate a change of narrator of time of location or something you know the usual stuff i learned this from george R. R. martin who was the first guy i saw do it and i said that's pretty good i'll do that all right you know i'm drinking that because i'm thirsty uh, <laughs> anyway i'll keep this back here so i don't spill stuff all over the place anyway uh the story uh there you go i got it I got it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I can't have a souvenir. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, I'm going to sell that on eBay. Anyway, uh, the story is called Big Science at the Bijou right now. You'll see why, right? Uh, if this light's in anybody's eyes, I'm sorry, but I need it to read by it, okay? Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Oppenheimer awoke, breathing hard and sweating, feeling uneasy and elated at the same time, like a kid who had, had a, just had dreamed of spoiled ice cream. He had crawled his way toward his bed, dead tired after a 23-hour session on some arcane bit of the gadget, and fallen into what had he, he what fallen into what he had hoped was sweet oblivion. Only it wasn't. He had dreamed he was walking down a city street, not here in Los Alamos or nearby Santa Fe or further Albuquerque, but somewhere back east, Boston or New York or New Jersey. He was on his way somewhere. He assumed it was to the movie. It was to a movie. Since this wasn't Santa Fe, it couldn't be the theater where he had seen Since You Went Away last week on a rare trip out of town, the collection of industrial buildings, barracks, houses, and old and odd assorted uh, structures that was, that was wartime Los Alamos. There, now, there were now maybe only about 20 cottonwoods on the whole place. He passed some, some, some bars and juke joints in his dream, and the sound coming out wasn't Benny Goodman or Tom, Tommy Dorsey, but the, but the kind William Bendix referred to in some movie as monkey music. It was loud, discordant, and had a 4-4 signature. <clears throat> the crowds were headed toward a highly lighted distant corner. Not a mob scene like a, at a Louis Armstrong concert, but people just out for something that turned out to be the same thing. He moved in the in the dream as he sometimes did when dreaming, and sometimes when the dreams became too boring from repetition or frustration, he could awake himself from it, figuring why bother. This dream seemed to be staying focused. He got to the bright corner, which was the theater, 
stood in a rapidly lengthening line, moved up, got his ticket. It seemed to cost more than the normal 25 cents. He didn't look at the change from the silver dollar he had passed over, but it wasn't six bits. He, he, he noticed as he pushed it back into his pants pocket. As he was passing through the garish lobby, he decided in his dream he was in a post-war period. That would, that would explain not being in New Mexico, the different music, the cost of the movie, the slightly seedier clothes on the crowd. Many men, himself included, were without hats and in short sleeves. In his dream, Oppenheimer was at the edge of the crowd, looking at the lobby cards and stills from the coming attractions. Some of them, some of the act, some of the actors in them were familiar, were recognizable, but now older and in different kinds of movies than he was used to. At one point, he passed a small table with a cardboard stand-up of a. a Blow up, blown up lime, uh, lemon jello box with a sign, Mom, have you entered the jello fruit up the holidays recipe contest yet? First prize, $100 cash and a year's supply of delicious jello. And, and art showing Grandma bringing a giant cooked turkey to the table and mom bringing some ungodly jello concoction in a blunt cake pan beside her. <laughs> For some reason, the display filled Oppenheimer with a feeling of dread. <laughs> <laughs> he walked dreamlike halfway down the house and chose an aisle seat at the left middle of the one quarter, one half, one quarter rows of seats. His dream skipped the previews the newsreel and the four cartoons. He did watch the Three Stooges short. Moe's brother Shimp was back replacing Curly. Then, then with loud music and some far away honking cries, the feature started. Robert, Robert found this was some hybrid production, mostly Japanese, but narrated in flashback by an American reporter stopping off in Tokyo on his way to Vienna just as ships in the Sea of Japan began disappearing in flashes of light and fire. The opening has the American being pulled out from under the rubble of the news service building he was reporting from and taken on to a hospital where he finds the daughter of an old friend helping the nurses. <clears throat> now, the old friend, the chief scientist, is in the dream logic of the is in the dream logic of the dream movie a paleontologist because a paleontologist will be needed in the investigation of ships exploding in fire. The daughter had been betrothed since childhood to a lonely introverted marine biologist but lately has fallen in love with a young naval lieutenant. This is where Oppenheimer in his dream begins to question his own narrative engine. <laughs> the Japanese seem to have been rearmed after the war for this is surely ten or so years onwards and the latest U.S. military, and with the latest U.S. military weapons. Eventually, the movie turns into a film very much like King Kong, which Robert had seen 10 years ago when he was 29. There's even an mm -hmm. island where the natives, vaguely Japanese, explain all forces of nature as ones from a 400 foot tall revived dinosaur. From his paleontology classes, Robert Oppenheimer remembered 
100 feet was about the maximum length for dinosaurs and most of those look like whips on both ends. But he, he, he went along with his own dream. The huge lizard attacked Tokyo, invading, wading through buildings and high voltage lines like so much annoying butter. It blew breath that, that melted pylons, wires, and tanks like models made out of wax. Now the, now the reporter's old friend, the dinosaur <laughs> expert, begins explaining things, and Opie found this the most interesting in his dream state. Tokyo Bay must have been its ancestral breeding ground. Recent H-bomb, there was that word, must have driven off the, its usual prey, and it began searching elsewhere for food like ships, and their crews. The H-bomb must be what Teller was always talking about, calling it the super a fission fusion fission bomb, a fission fusion fission bomb, as opposed to the simple fission device they were, they were, they were working on at Los Alamos, which everyone called the gadget. So the gadget, at least, must have worked. There was no mention in the dream movie of Germany. Had the gadget worked so well, Germany and the Nazis had been completely destroyed? But the film in, in Oppie's mind Im, implied at least a few gadgets had been used on Japan. Japan, that wasn't even a consideration in this year of 1943. Japan was a sideshow. The object was to perfect the gadget and use it on the Nazis, the Nazi bastards before they got one of their own and dropped it on Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt at one of their big three get-togethers. But not Japan. The movie went on to show the large lizard not being stopped by any weapon used on it. Then the, then the introverted and one-eyed marine biologist, the chief paleontologist's daughter used to be engaged to, showed her something he dropped into a nearby aquarium, turning the swimming fish to floating skeletons. We see her reaction. She had, she had come to break off all connection with, with, with her former betrothed and only see this scene in full as remembered by her later. He and the young naval lieutenant in diving suits descend to the bottom of Tokyo Bay and luring the big lizard toward them open the device called an oxygen destroyer. The big lizard, though not as sympathetic, uh, not a sympathetic figure like Kong in 1933, Takes, takes on the heightened pathos as the foam, like a mad bromo seltzer, rises around him. Its skeleton floats away and the dream movie ended in Robert Oppenheimer's head in his bed in 1943 for a space break. <laughs> Opie was 6'4 and never in his life weighed more than 125 pounds. Enrico Fermi had said he looked like he had blown in like a tumbleweed on the last breath of wind and that the next would take him far beyond the horizon. Only the weight of his intellect had held him to the ground. This was the same Fermi who, with others, had built the world's first nuclear reactor by hand in the unheated squash courts below the bleachers at Amos Alonzo Stagg Field at the University of Chicago in 1942. The scientists piling up 20,000 pounds of graphite bars, a ton of low-grade uranium oxide slugs, 
and dowel rods wrapped in sheet cadmium kept, kept warm, warm enough from the work, but the GI guards standing stock still with rifles at the doors were freezing in the unheated air. Till one of the Manhattan Project scientists found a locker full of stuff from when the Chicago Bears pro football team used to play there and the guards got warmer with a bunch of Bula Bula raccoon skin overcoats left over from the 1920s. Fermi expected them to have a Springfield on one shoulder and a ukulele on the other. <coughs> But, but warm was warm. Alpi went back over the, the movie in his mind, in his mind. <laughs> the gadget had been used, so evidently had the super, and on Japan and were being tested in the Pacific and no Germany. He finished up a cigarette, one of Segre's Chesterfields he had borrowed yesterday and looked over the, out the window at the westering moon. He remembered the days when the project had been given the cover name, the Department of Substitute Materials, as if they were the guys, due to the wartime shortages, who were finding ways to turn Texas crude oil into grade A butter or get people with Victory Gardens to trans form American Beauty Roses into truck tires. <laughs> that had lasted about three months till people kept calling, writing, and dropping by the Washington office with their crackpot ideas of how to defeat the Japanese rats. So the government created a real DSM so physicists could get back, around, back to their real work. The ITS Having, hit, having a fission bomb shake hands with Hitler. So that, that part could go on. Today was Sunday. His wife was off in San Francisco at some lefty function, so instead of putting on a suit and tie and going to the lab, he would have the day off in, 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 blue je in the blue jeans and blue chambray shirt, work shirt. Fermi was in from the Chicago Met Lab. He would meet with him later in the afternoon. The whole project was one of grudging res respect. Groves, the general in charge, grudgingly respected Oppenheimer and most of the, of the long hairs. They distantly admired him because no matter how left wing they were, as long as they were doing their work, their jobs, keeping, uh, keeping quiet about it, and only wanted to explode Hitler butt, only, only wanted to explode Hitler butt, they were okay with him. Leo Zillard, who had actually drafted the letter to Roosevelt Einstein had signed in 1939 uh, about, the, about the Germans' fission research and the possibility of their coming up with a <laughs> uranium bomb gave Groves a case of the pip. He was always going on about the scientist's duty to mankind, yada, yada, yada. But Opie had convinced Groves that Zillard was exactly the gadfly they needed to get, the, to get things done. 
Teller was another matter. Brian, he, he wanted to cut right to the chase, pass up the fission bomb research and go right to a fission fusion fission one. Why, why, why make firecrackers when you can have dynamite? Once the secret is out, they'll know you're coming for them. The problem with Teller was that he wore, wore out your brake pads. He wanted, he wanted Nazis not just dead, but vaporized. The movie, the movie he had dreamed had taken a Teller-like turn, especially with Germany not mentioned once in its, in its, in its duration. So, so maybe Edward's dream had come true but with Japan once again as an ally, and and we we go we join up to kick Big Lizard butt. Why is there so much testing going on in the in the film? Oppenheimer questioned his own dream mechanic. His own dream mechanic. Where was where was a four where was a four hundred foot tall monster? Try, what was a 400-foot monster trying to tell him? That the coming atomic age would breed monster, <coughs> monsters? Surely that was, a, was dream logic. Would you need not engineers but psychiatrists? <laughs> in the coming decade, in the middle of war, it seemed fairly straightforward to him. You do what you you can to get a fission bomb before the Nazis get theirs. They were, they, were, they were first to cause a chain reaction after all, spurring all this frantic running around. The only thing we can hope is that Hitler is such a madman, things are in disarray over there, that they, can, they, can get organ, they can't get organized enough. If we can do anything, it's get organized when we have to. This damn thing might actually get built, he saw. Whether, whether the one we're working on or Teller's super, he didn't know. Maybe Zillard was right. Whatever happens, we'll all have to think about what, whatever we're doing. Beyond the stop Hitler angle, that comes first. He had been both disturbed and, and heartened by his dream, by his dream movie. For some reason, the Jello contest had disturbed him more than the rest of the dream itself. It may be a dichotomous world we would enter, but one where there was still room for Jello and four and a four hundred and and four hundred foot tall dinosaurs who breathed fire. He would tell Fermi and a few others about his strange movie of a dream. <coughs> but certainly not General Groves, who would be all over it like a duck on a June bug. He would call the FBI and Army Intelligence. I've got scientists dreaming about a, the post-war world that's full of giant lizards and crushed cities, Groves would say cholerically. What do you want us to do? Hoover would ask. Make them stop, Groves <laughs> said. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Brad, you guys want to pull up a couple of chairs here? Or? Yeah.